Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the St. Louis Zoo. I'm Louise Bradshaw. I'm the Director of Education here at the Zoo, and it's really my pleasure to you know, help launch tonight's talk, our science seminar series that we've done for you know, well over 10 years and, and with the Academy of Science of St. Louis and, and way beyond that. So we're very, very thrilled to be able to host this series with the Academy. Um, we also focus on our conservation conversation series. Last night we had a wonderful s speaker from the St. Louis Zoo, Dr. Sharon Deem, who spoke about our new Institute for Conservation Medicine. So as part of our, our mission to really get the word out about interesting things happening in science, we're also very, very thrilled to be able to um, provide this opportunity for you all to learn more about renewable energy, how we can live more lightly on the planet. It's something that we care very deeply about here at the St. Louis Zoo. A lot of the animals in our care face significant threats in the wild, and a lot of it is because of the dramatic costs that, um, you know, really, we're kind of like using up that capital here on the planet very quickly and not very good at sharing, are we? So hopefully we'll learn some really new things tonight. I'm really excited about this opportunity to, to see how we can turn things around for the better. So I'd like to uh, introduce Rose Jansen from the Academy, who'll give you more details about the Science Seminar Speaker Series and other talks the Academy has and introduce our speaker. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Rose. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, as Louise said, and we're very pleased to partner with the zoo to bring you the 2011-2012 Science Seminar Series Talks. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Academy of Science, I'm gonna take just a moment to tell you who we are. Uh, we're an independent, nonprofit science organization. We're supported entirely through community contributions. We've been connecting science and the community since 1856. And we have a very long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we do that through a very broad range of free and low-cost public science seminars and trips and tours that, si that highlight science at venues throughout the region. And you can find more information on the Academy and our public science programs at our website, uh, Academy of Science, STL.org, or you may also visit us on Facebook or Twitter, or you can pick up some of our literature that is at the visitor's desk outside the auditorium. Um, I'd like to uh, mention just a couple upcoming events you might have an interest in attending. On Friday, December 9, from 1.30 to 3 p.m. at the Center of Clayton, UMSL teaching professor of geology, Michael Fix, talks on Monster in the Hollow, the story of Missouri's Ozark dinosaur. This event is open to all, and it is free to the first 10 registrants, and is $9 per person thereafter. So you do need to register to attend, and you may do so by calling 314-533-8586, or by emailing rsvp at academyofsciencestl.org. And again, there's more information on our website. On Tuesday evening, December 13, from 7 to 8.30 PM, we have paleontologist and author Dr. Bruce Stinchcomb, he'll be talking about the prehistoric animals that lived in Missouri and throughout the St. Louis region during the Pleistocene era in Missouri's Ice Age megafauna, St. Louis area big bones. This event is also free and open to the public and it's part of our Perspectives on Science and History series and it's being presented in conjunction with the Missouri History Museum's traveling exhibition, Mammoths and Mastodons, Titans of the Ice Age. Um, if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there will be some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience, and there is one at the visitor's desk. Uh, if you're a student and you need to verify your attendance here tonight, uh, I'll either have stickers available, I'm not sure if I remember to bring those, but if I don't, I'll just give you one of my business cards and hopefully that will work for you. So come see me after tonight's talk. Um, one more uh, upcoming event I want to mention. So next year, 2012, this is also part of our science seminar series here. So it's at the Living World here in the zoo, uh, at the zoo at 7.30 p.m. We have Dr. Greg Wilson. He was recently named uh, the director for the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab. And he'll be talking on the current status and likely future of solar photovoltaic energy around the world in photons to electrons. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. David Peters. Dr. Peters is widely recognized as an expert in design and analysis of rotary wing aircraft. 
His theory of dynamic inflow is the world standard for wake modeling and rotorcraft dynamics and simulation. His continuing research on rotorcraft modeling and analysis has led to the publication of more than 180 papers. Currently, he is the McDonnell Douglas Professor of Engineering, Director of the Center for Computational Mechanics, and Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. He received his PhD in Aeronautics and Astronautics from Stanford University, and his undergraduate and graduate degrees in Applied Mechanics from Washington University. His prior professional experience includes work for McDonnell Astronautics on several space vehicles, including NASA's Skylab, and work as a research scientist at NASA's Ames Research Center in California. He is the founding director of the Georgia Space Grant Consortium, a NASA-funded center, and is an adjunct professor at Georgia Tech, where he is also the associate director of the Rotorcraft Center. Dr. Peters is here with us tonight to talk about wind energy. Won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. David Peters. All right, we're going to talk about uh, wind energy tonight. Um, we're mainly going to talk about large wind turbines, power generation, um, something contributing to the United States of America and our uh, ability to create energy without greenhouse gases. So I'm not going to be talking about the smaller wind turbines that you might use for your home or you see on top of the buildings around here. Um, I teach a class in wind energy in the spring semester at Washington U, and what I'll show you tonight is sort of a modified version of the introductory lecture. But for you all, the only prerequisites you have to have are an interest in wind, wind energy. But if you're interested in a textbook or a book, uh, Wind Energy Explained is really a nice book that uh, has chapters just about on every part of wind, wind energy. And um, I'm going out to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory um, in Golden, Colorado. She just mentioned the new director a while back. And the guy out there I'm going to go see, he teaches a wind energy course at the University of Boulder, Colorado. And he uses this text, too, for the course that he teaches. He says it's really a nice text. If you'd like to contact me later on, here's my phone number and my e email address. Has some questions you want to run by me or you want to check out my website. Um, first, let's talk about the taxonomy of wind turbines, that's how, how are they constructed, what do they look like, what are the different parts, and then we'll look at the current market. You know, what's the wind uh, power that's possible in this country, how much is being generated now, how much could be generated. Um, we're talking about tonight, I'm going to talk mainly about horizontal axis wind turbines, H-A-W-T. That means there's a tower and the axis that the rotor rotates about is on this horizontal plane. There are vertical axis wind turbines, too, that spin around, and they have an advantage. The wind can come in any direction, but they're generally smaller. They're really not set up for big wind turbines of the megawatt size like we're talking about for reasons that the front blades, as they come around and hit the wind, all that turbulence off of those comes back and hits the rear blades. And plus, the front blades have to slow down the air to get the energy, that doesn't leave it much in the back. So for the large wind turbines, we'll be talking about the horizontal axis wind turbines. Some are upwind, so the rotor is upwind and the wind hits it from this side, and some are downwind, where the rotor is downwind and the wind comes this way. Um, a lot of the older windmills were downwind because they kind of helped them to feather. They could follow the wind. But when you do that again, all the wind hitting this tower and all the turbulence that comes off of it hits the blades. And so for really low vibrations and good clean blades, usually wind turbines are upwind. So the wind hits up here, and then there has to be a, something in the tower to keep this thing pointed uh, within the right direction. In the current market, almost all wind turbines that are large, making a lot of power, are horizontal axis wind turbines. And most have two or three blades. You could, of course, have any number of blades in a wind turbine. You've seen the old farm windmills around Missouri. They may have you know, 15 or 16 blades. But the most efficient windmill would be one blade, but that's not very feasible because of the, uh, the different weights on the two sides. So two blades is very efficient, but even two has a lot of vibrations because it doesn't have polar symmetry. It's different in one direction than the other. So a lot of times three blades is, seems to be the, what most people would use. So I'd say most today are two or three blades with the predominantly ones probably being three. 
Um, windmills around the world are different sizes, but there's some today as big as seven megawatts. So if you think about that, 100,000 60 watt light bulbs you could do with these. So they're pretty large and they're in farms. We have windmill after windmill after windmill creating this energy. And so we're talking about very large scale wind power around the world. We're not just talking about the single wind turbine you might put out at your farm to pump water or something. Um, let's look at some of the components you'd have on a wind turbine. You have the rotor, okay, we're talking about here. There has to be some hub that connects it to something inside, right? And you've got to have some sort of control, right? There's got to be a control because so many things are happening. The wind speed is changing, the wind direction is changing. Um, you've got a system inside that maybe has a drivetrain, some generators, and it can only take so much power. If the wind gets too big, you can't handle all that power. Somehow you have to be able to throttle back. And then you need some sort of a yaw system so that you can point, keep pointing towards the wind. The best thing to do is have yourself vertical with the wind, but the wind changes direction. So you need a computer on board, something to keep track of all this, have some logic, and even to tell it when to turn off, right? When is the wind power, when is the wind too big? Your th thunderstorms, you have to shut down and, and do it all that. There has to be a tower, of course, and then some sort of an electrical system. I was talking to the gentleman down here a while ago. You got to get whatever power you're generating into the electrical grid. So it has to have the right voltage, the right current, the right phase to go into that grid. So there, there has to be some sort. Usually that's down here, but the generator and everything else is usually up at the top. Now, from aerodynamic considerations, almost all towers just have a circular cross section. It's easy to manufacture, and the wind speeds we're talking about, it has the least amount of turbulence that comes off of it. So as you look around the country and around the world, you'll see that. Now, here's sort of a more detailed schematic of the parts. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight about the rotor diameter. The rotor has a certain size. You have the wind speed then coming in perpendicular to the wind. Um, the blades may be variable in pitch. That is, they can be feathered. And this is because you want to throttle. You want to be able to get the most you can out of the wind. Okay, we'll talk a little bit later about there's an optimum way to do that. So you don't want too big a thrust or too, or too uh, uh, small a thrust. You have to have a brake. Right? Sometimes things fail, the generator goes out, or you want to stop it. Or if you don't have a rotor brake, you're in big trouble, the thing will overspeed. Um, you have your, your generator and a gearbox. Thing is, the wind turbines are doing very slowly. Right? The tip speed is maybe going six times the wind speed. So if the wind were 30 miles an hour, uh, the tip is going maybe 180 miles an hour, but it's way out there, maybe 70 feet out. So if you're looking at a large wind turbine, and watch, you can watch it go around. It's like whoosh, 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 whoosh. So it's very slow. You've got to get that up now to maybe 60 cycle or whatever you want to generate. So there has to be a gearbox in here that can get this slow speed up to the speed you need to generate. And that gearbox has to be able to last a long time, be able to take a lot of cycles, and not be able to fatigue because it's a very expensive thing to change one of these gearboxes. Out at, uh, I do some work with uh, Mesa Lands Community College in Tucumcari, New Mexico. They train wind turbine technicians. It's an economically depressed area. A lot of the Native American tribes are there. And, but there's a huge market for wind turbine technicians. They have a junior college. And there they have a 1.5 megawatt GE turbine. They told me that they got money from the state to build it, but if it ever broke down, they have a parts contract, but they don't have a maintenance contract. Just to take a crane out there to take the transmission out would be $30,000, just to rent the crane, let alone what it would cost for the new transmission or the stuff to put it in. So it's very important to have high uh, efficiency and high reliability gear gearboxes up there. Um, all this is covered with what's called an nacelle, and that's a fairing to let the air go around uh, uh, smoothly. Then you have to have your yaw control system so that you can make this thing point pointed towards the wind. When we talk about a height of a wind turbine, we're talking about to the center. So actually it goes up, you know, the height plus half the rotor diameter. In some of these wind turbines, the top can be close to as high as the arch. So we're talking about some very large wind turbines that are out there. Um, 
there has to be a foundation, something this thing is built on, and then the control panels and the power circuitry we talked about before in order to get that power to where, to where it is you want to go. Um, inside that nacelle, if you look a little uh, closer, here's again that hub, that here's the blades will go way out. Here you have your, gear, your, uh, your gearbox, your main shaft, your rotor brake, and the generator that has to produce everything that, that you need, and then the yaw, the yaw mechanism and the, and the tower. Now that's the taxonomy of the wind turbine. Let's talk about what, what's happened in the United States over the past few, uh, few, few years. We're going to look here, these are years going up to about 2009, and I'll talk about what happened in the last two, two years since then. The second column is how many megawatts were added in America each year, and then this is the total capacity we had. And what you can see is back in the 1980, 1983, we were adding a lot of capacity. And then all of a sudden, right down in here, we stopped adding. And that's because there were tax credits back in this time. And so people were building wind turbines to get the tax credits. Out in California, they had huge farms of wind turbines that weren't even operating. They just build them to get the tax credits and wouldn't even run them. So the tax credits all ran out here. But as time went on, um, oil became more and more expensive. People got more and more interested in greenhouse gases and eliminating them. And so the capacity has begun to grow. So we were about 37,000 megawatts by 2009. 32, rather, we're up to over 40,000 megawatts in the United States today in terms of wind power. And I'll try to put that into perspective later on in terms of the nuclear and the coal fire things that, that we have. Um, here's that same data maybe on a graph, if you like graphs. So these reds are how much we added each year up to 2009, and the greens, the uh, total in America. So you can see how it's just been ra ramping up, and now it's up about, about here to 40,000 now, and it's just, it's just going to keep going up. Um, the state of Texas predicts that probably by 2015, they're thinking that the wind energy industry in their state is going to pass the airline industry in terms of the amount of economic uh, jobs and money it is into their economy. They, of course, they have huge areas of the desert with a lot of wind. They're building an infrastructure to get that power up. Uh, one of the problems in Texas is they have three different grids, power grids, that aren't even connected to each other. You're not into the rest of the grid, and they got to figure out how to get energy from one to the other. But they're building right now, they're building the power lines and everything to do it. And one of my former students, Andy Swift, is down at uh, Texas Tech, and they're doing a lot of research down there, actually building wind energy farms as part of their re research bid. Um, Texas also has this thing, if oil companies pay fines or something for doing bad things, the money goes into a pot that... Uh, universities can bid on to do alternative energy research. And so this then provides a way for them to get some of this energy done besides the normal Department of Energy or the National Renewable Energy Labs. Here's that same data again, just with one, one, one curve. So you can see how it's it kind of flattened out when the tax credits went away, but now it's heading up. Now let's look a little bit about the history of wind turbines. You know, where they came from, how they've gone, what are some of the significant things that happened. Uh, back in about 400, there were Buddhist-driven, I mean, uh, wind-driven Buddhist prayer wheels. You know, the idea is you write a prayer on a strip of paper, and every time it goes around, that prayer goes up to heaven. So you have to sit there and spin it, and they figured out they could put this little windmill thing on there, and the wind could spin it, and they could get a lot of prayers up to heaven. So this is one of the first... Um, ideas in, in, that you'd see within uh, human beings trying to harness the wind power to do something they wanted done. 1200 to 1850, this is really the golden age of windmills in Western uh, Europe. There were probably 10,000 windmills in England at that time. Uh, one of those has been disassembled and rebuilt down at Texas Tech. Um, they have a big wind turbine museum there and it cost over a million bucks to get that thing disassembled and brought back and, and put up again. Uh, there were about 18,000 in Germany, about 9,000 in Holland, although Holland are definitely the most fa uh, famous of these, about 50,000 overall windmills during this time in Western Europe. Now it's interesting, Holland has very good records of this, and they did many technologically important things with the windmills. They learned about making the airfoils or the blades have a nice smooth shape. They learned about twist, they learned that actually your blade just isn't like a flat piece of board out there. If it's twisted, you can get more power. 
And in fact, the, one of the sagas of that, the first guy who invented the twist and decided to twist his windmill, it generated so much more power than it had before, it destroyed all the gears that were inside his windmill because it was just too much power to take. You know, they have the wooden gears and we have a lot of, even the word sabotage today, right? A sabot is a wooden shoe. And sometimes the, the people grinding the grain might get mad at their employer and throw their wooden shoe into the windmill gears. You know, that's where the word sabotage comes from. So it was a big time in Europe. Um, 1850 to 1930, that was the heyday of the small multi-blade windmills in the United States that you still see around Missouri. Mainly they were to pump water, they'd fill a water tank for cattle, and then they'd shut off when the bob came to the top. Or if the wind speed got too high, they'd shut off. They had a vane that kept them aligned with the wind. And when the flyball governor got to a certain speed and they were going too fast, they would, the vane would cock 90 degrees and just bring the thing 90 degrees out of the wind where it could just kind of idle there in that position until the wind speed went down or the water went down in the tank. Um, in 1933, Krasnovsky built a uh, 100 kilowatt uh, machine in the Russian Crimea. That was the first really large wind turbine that anybody ever did. So he began to look ahead to say, this is not just something I can do for my farm or something. This is something big can actually generate some, some, some electricity. Now in 1973, the energy crisis in the United States uh, really began to inspire um, interest in alternative energy sources. I was going to Stanford at that time, you know, it was during the gas crisis. We'd stand in line for hours just trying to get gas. Um, we could only buy gas on odd or even days. And uh, people said, man, we need some other kind of energy. All right. Um, 74 to 1980 then, the U.S. federal government began their large wind turbine program. At that time, Washington University got into wind turbines very big. I came as a professor in 75, and we built a 15 kilowatt wind, wind turbine, 25 foot in diameter, out at Tyson Research Center out, out west. We were, even though they have a lot of salamanders and wolves, and they're very careful about it, we said, we want to clear a ridge to put a wind turbine. They decided that was an environmentally friendly thing to do. So they let us clear, clear that ridge, and we built a wind turbine out there that we tested. Um, I remember when we sent our first cost estimates in uh, to the Department of Energy, we had tick spray and mouse traps on it, and they kicked it out and sent it back, said you can't charge tick spray and mouse traps. We said, yeah, the mice are chewing through our computer cables out there, and you know about ticks. So, so they decided that was okay then. We, we really could char charge that. So it was a heyday of wind turbine. And um, the federal government was really interested in the large wind turbines. They built the Mod O, which was the first uh, big wind turbine that NASA, the NASA built. But in, in 1976, the U.S. Energy Research and Development Administration, ER, ERDA, um, began a small wind turbine development program. Okay, they began to look at, at uh, smaller turbines. Then from 81 to 2007, that really came the, the boom bust uh, era. It started off with the boom times in 81 through 93, where more than 12,000 units were built. And then in 85 and 86, the federal and California tax credits went, went away and everything crashed. Um, another interesting date, 1991, the first commercial offshore wind farm in, Den in Denmark. And these means wind turbines out in the ocean, right, out in the bay, because there's a lot more wind that's out there. In 1996, uh, Kenetech Wind Power, which now is called U.S. Wind Power, was, was the largest U.S. and world manufacturer. They declared the bankruptcy. They were assets were sold to Enron Wind, you know what happened to Enron, and they're, they're, they were acquired by GE Wind. So GE is now probably America's biggest manufacturer of wind turbines. And they make a 1.5 megawatt machine, the one I talked about out at uh, to Tucumcari, New Mexico, okay, that's very popular. They sell a lot of them. People use them in wind farms. It's a good size machine, and uh, it's very reliable, and they have a lot of development within it. Um, from 1990 to 2000, megawatt wind turbines began to be installed in, in Europe, and that began to grow at about 20% a year. In 1998 to 99, the European manufacturers um, began to open windmill factories in the U.S. and China, including the Vestas from Denmark. Denmark. I have a student who works for Vestas in uh, Texas right, right now. 2004. Um, RE Power in Germany developed a 5 megawatt, 126 meter diameter horizontal axis wind turbine 
Now it's been upgraded to seven megawatts. I'll show you some photos of that uh, later, later on. In 2007, the Department of Energy announced a goal and a program to further wind turbine development. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of those uh, uh, details about that. Now let's look at the world wind power capacity here. Okay, so we're gonna look at the capacity in megawatts of, di of different countries. The United States here is on the bottom. You can see this, we sort of had this curve before. It's been grown and now out here by 2011, it's up to about uh, 40,000 now up to here. Here's Germany, who has been big, big, bigger than us. Here's Spain, very big in wind power. China, up here, uh, yeah, China, India, and then the rest of the world. And China is growing. Since 2008, China is about to pass the United States now in wind. Um, they've also just passed us, I think, in cell phone use, and there was something else that they just passed us in, but they're about to pass us in wind. They are just going great guns uh, trying, trying to build wind turbines. You can see the whole world, though, that's totally here if you add everything up, right? About 100, by now, probably 150,000 meg megawatts of power that's being created by wind worldwide. If you look at the world's energy resources, and this is it's kind of a tough number to look at in the ways you're comparing apples to oranges, because what's a resource? You know, in terms of, for example, here you see the, uh, new, this orange here is the nuclear, down here is uh, coal, right, and uh, petroleum and stuff, oh, here's coal, sorry. Um, in terms of what's available now, geothermal, what's installed now? And there's this little piece right here that's blowing up here into, into the uh, more, more uh, what you would call renewable energy. Wood's renewable because you can grow it. Geothermal is renewable. Other biomass like corn and then basically wind is here. So wind takes about 42% of this renewable slot here. Not a very big part of the whole world picture yet, uh, but it definitely has the potential uh, to be that. Um, Here's that pie from maybe what I showed before, the share of world installed wind capacity back in two, 2005 with Germany, Spain, the United States, India, Denmark, and others. Now Denmark looks pretty small, but in terms of the percent, they're a small country, in terms of the percentage of their country run by wind, they lead everybody else, okay, in terms of what, what they have. In 2007, the Sun Sentinel had an, or, or, an article that said the Department of Energy said the nation's wind power capacity increased by 27% in 2006, and that we had the fastest growing wind power capacity in the world in 2005 and 2006. And that was true until this past year when now China's percent of increase has um, e e e eclipsed ours. At that time, 1% of the U.S. power was coming from wind. Now it's up to about 3.5% of the U.S. power at this time is coming from wind. Right. Um, through 2008 to 2011, that's really the green energy era. It was uh, wind turbine booms around the world, Europe, U.S., India, an unprecedented federal and state support to further wind turbine development. There were tax credits, research funding, development grants have come. There's loans to industry. Um, the emergence of wind turbine technician training programs through community colleges, like the one I talked about at Tucumcari, they're putting out 150 to 200 wind turbine technicians a year that are all finding jobs because these things are growing by leaps and bounds and they need people to maintain these wind, these wind turbines. So by the end of 2010, the U.S. had 40,000 installed megawatts, 3% of our total, by now it's up to 3.5%. And estimates are it could be maybe 20%, 30%, maybe even 35% uh, by 2050. It's probably not gonna grow more than that. We're never gonna have 100% of our power from wind. But 25% or 30%, that is a huge amount. And that's a tremendous reduction in greenhouse gases if you could have that much stuff coming from wind. And those are realistic estimates. Um, the Department of Energy outpaces uh, the venture capital in clean tech investments. And that's one of the things that's happened through, um, if you look at the energy sector, Department of Energy plans to lend or grant more than 40 billion to companies back in 2009, it said and about 13 billion to business. So at that time, there wasn't as much venture capital, but now in 2011, a lot of venture capital is going into this, and people, like in the state of Texas, people are really starting to build. Now let's look at this, 40,000 megawatts in the United States. 
Okay, how does that compare to other things? For example, the Labadee coal fire plant here in Missouri. That is 2,400 megawatts. So basically the wind in the United States is like 17 Labadees. So that's a lot of power you're talking about. Or if you look at Callaway Nuclear Plant, that's a 1.1 megawatt machine. U.S. wind is about 40 Callaways. So it's, it's a significant effect, even at 3.5 percent. And if it went to 20 or 25 or 35 percent, it would make a, a big dent in uh, the greenhouse gases we were putting out. Now what about the cost of building one of these things, right? Um, coal is about $2,500 per installed max kilowatt. Nuclear is, ch is cheaper that for installed price. Of course, you have to look at the life cycle cost and what it costs to dispose of the fuel. But for nuclear, it's about $2,000 per installed max kilowatt. Wind is about $3,500 per installed max kilowatt. So it's more expensive now to put in wind turbine than the others. But you're paying for the, the decreased greenhouse gases. Photovoltaic is about $6,000 right now, but it's dropping. And so photovoltaic is becoming more and more um, important and down in Texas, where they have these huge farms of wind turbines, as far as the eye can see, they're in the desert. They got the land already. They're putting photovoltaic on the ground between the wind turbines because they don't have to buy land. And so that's a good, and they have a lot of sun. So that's an example of what, of what can happen. Now let's look a little about the, uh, some of the famous people in the, in the history of wind turbines. Uh, Paul Lecour of Denmark was one of those who really had an early vision of what wind turbines could do. Albert Betz in uh, Germany worked out a lot of the theory for wind turbines. What's the best way to operate a wind turbine? How much energy could they really get? Um, uh, Putnam down here, I'll talk about more about him in a second. He was really a pioneer in the United States in wind turbine and built our first very large wind turbine. And then in Germany, okay. Um, uh, Palmer Cross of Putnam, he was the first to demonstrate the development of large wind turbines and an application to electric grid. And he collaborated back in 1941 with the Morgan Smith Company. In October, he installed a wind turbine on the hill in Vermont called Grandpa's Knob. It was 53 meters in diameter, two stainless steel blades with flapping hinges like a helicopter blade would be. It was 1.25 megawatt rated power. This is back in 1941. It was a 35.6 millimeter tower and it operated for four years and fed electricity into the utility grid of, of Vermont. Um, it generated 1.25 megawatts of electric power at the peak. In 1945, the rotor blade fracture led to uh, uh, the destruction of the machine. There was a fatigue damage and there were some, also some storms that came in and they, they didn't get a chance to shut down the wind, wind tur turbine in time. And then the war, of course, it was during the war time, it was hard to get any parts or anything to, fi to fi fix that. But that was our first really big wind, wind turbine. Um, his results really are remarkable compared with what we do now. And um, let me show up, I think, um, I'm gonna go up and get, I think I have a, yeah, based on the 1937, uh, prices, they were predicting back then they could build 10, 1500 kilowatt units at an estimate of $190 per kilowatt back then. Okay, but $125 per kilowatt is what they thought was affordable. And so at that time they decided it just wasn't affordable to make them, but, so they didn't. But this is a picture of what it, lo of what it lo uh, looked like. This, it's tilted like this because it's on a ridge top and the wind is actually coming from this side up over. So the wind's coming up over the hill. This is a downwind turbine, so the, wind, the wind's coming this way. So it was very, but just w w way ahead, ahead of its time and anyone interested in wind turbines or wind turbine history should look at that. Now, how much energy can you really get out of a wind turbine? Again, it's a pretty simple calculation. Somebody with high school physics experience could actually do this. What's happened is you got the wind turbine, you think about a big cylinder of air that's coming through your wind, wind turbine. It's got some velocity, say an average velocity U. All right, uh, we're gonna assume it's just uniform velocity just coming straight through. Really wind turbines, there's a big gradient in velocity from the ground up when they're very large, okay? Um, so you have this mass that's coming through. If rho is the density of air, 
and pi d squared over 4 is the area, you basically have a Q here, a cubic meters per second of the area times the velocity. That's how many cubic meters per second of air are coming through. The mass flow rate is rho times Q, the density. So that's the kilograms per second that are coming through there. Okay, so that you have that many, the kinetic energy of something is one half mv squared. So the kinetic energy per unit time is your power. That's one half the mass flow times u squared. But the mass flow is rho au. So the energy coming through any wind turbine at any, at any instant in time, the power is one half rho a u cubed. That means the power of, of the air coming in is, goes as the cube of the wind speed. So when the wind speed doubles, the power goes up by a factor of eight. And this is why it's very important to find a site that has large wind speeds. Missouri hardly has any sites in the whole state that are really adequate to create a lot of wind energy. Way up in the northwest, there's a tiny little piece and there's even a smaller piece way up in the northeast. But you just don't have it there because you need some big wind speeds. And like I said, it goes to the cube. So if you can get more, more wind speed out, you're in a lot better shape. Right. Now that's how much wind is coming through, how much power is coming through your rotor. But you can never get all of that power out. Because as you try to get power out of the wind, you have to slow it down to take the energy out. But if you slow it down too much, it stops. Then you don't have any flow coming through at all. So it turns out the best way to operate a turbine is to slow the wind down by one third. That is to two thirds of its original value. So if I have a 30 mile an hour wind, I want to slow it down to 20 miles an hour. That's how much energy and that's the most. And that turns out to be 59% of the energy coming in. That's the most I could possibly get. Most wind turbines can't even get that. They have other losses. They maybe run at 40 to 41%. Right. Now there's a wind turbine has to have certain critical speeds. There is a cut in speed. How fast does the wind have to be before I can turn it on? Otherwise it won't even turn. And then after the cut-in speed, there's the rated speed. That's the speed the manufacturer you know, puts on the outside of the box when you buy the wind turbine. What it's rated at, that's where it's humming. <laughs> that's where it's operating at the best. But then you have to have a cut-out speed. When the wind gets too big, you can't handle that much power, and you've got to stop it. So those three things really tell you how much power you can get out of a wind turbine. So if you looked at the power you could get out, first there's a cut-in speed out here <clears throat> where you can finally turn it on. After that, power goes to the cube of the wind speed. So it's really going up fast, but you start getting losses. The higher the wind speed, the more losses, so it starts to come down. And then here's your rated wind power. That's what you advertise on your website, right? That that's how much power you can generate. When the wind gets bigger than that, you actually start losing power, and finally you reach a place where you have to shut it down. So the area under this curve that's all the power you can really get, and it depends on the probability you'll have a certain wind speed on any given day. And you've got to figure out if in all the days and all the wind speeds, you know, what's the different probabilities, and the National uh, Weather Service has those, you can do the computation. How much power could I generate in 20 years at this location? And then does that pay for putting a wind turbine at this, at this place? Now, another thing you can do to wind turbines to throttle them back is to yaw them. In other words, they're right into the wind. If you get too much wind, you can start to yaw them out. And Kurt Hohenemser, who worked with me uh, at Washington University in the, in the 70s, he really pioneered this idea of yawing them. And the big 7 megawatt machine now in Europe does use that as another way to throttle back. And when that happens then, instead of actually having just to stop here, because you have too much power to take, you can just start yawing out of the wind and come down more slowly here. And that allows you to get more power on more days, because you have to design, you can't design a wind turbine to take any 100 mile an hour wind that would come. You'd be wasting money if you never have a 100 mile an hour wind. So you're trying to get the most uh, cost effective wind, 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 wind turbine. Now, some recent advances. Here's the one I talked about, the five megawatt machine, the European um, the cut-in speed, 3.5 meters per second. That's where it turns on. If the rated wind speed, that's where it gets the most power out, 13 meters per second. The cut-out speed, there's two versions. There's an offshore version they put out in the ocean 
That can go up to 30 meters per second before it cuts out. It has a stronger transmission. The uh, onshore version is 25 meters per second. The rotor diameter is 126 meters, trying to put that in perspective. And the height to the hub is 120. So if you take the 120 plus half this diameter, the 63, it's 183 meters to, to the top. So you're talking about something that's getting close to the top of the arch at that, at that size. Here's a picture of them assembling that machine with a crane, trying to get it up to the top. Here's a picture of the offshore reversion with some there. And here's, the, here's one of the wind turbine itself operating. And up there are people, if you can look there and see that. Those are hu human beings that are standing on top, top of there. All right, so this is the kind of size wind turbine that we're talking about people are building and having large farms that, that have those. Now that means there's a lot of things have to be done. When something's this high up off the ground, you may have to use a helicopter to get up here to get some of the stuff in you want to do. You have to maintain the blades. Birds hit blades. That's one of the environmental detriments of wind turbines. Birds and bats tend to fly right into wind turbines, and people don't like that. A lot of research going on how to stop that noisemakers or flashing lights or something to stop that from happening. Uh, if you're building them down in Texas in the desert, maybe there's not that many birds, but offshore, there's all kinds of birds. The noise, of course, they make. I talked about that whooshing sound. People in Holland and Denmark do not like that noise. And just the visual impact. Some people don't like the way they look. Of course, when the Eiffel Tower was built, it was panned completely by the French. It looked horrible, and now they learn to love it. So as an engineer, I love wind turbines. I think they look beautiful. But if, you know, right now they're talking about building offshore wind turbines off of Cape Cod. Well, you have a little cottage on Cape Cod. Do you want to open your shutters in the morning and see a bunch of wind turbines offshore turning? You know, they don't want to see that. So there's been a lot of pushback uh, from people about that. Now, this is sort of a plot with the wind turbines of the future of, of promise. What size wind turbines are going to be? Here's the Washington Mon Monument. Okay. Um, <coughs> Here's the size we're talking about, what you are basically now, how big they could be. This is kind of where we're going. Maybe that's about to get to the size of the Washington Monument or the arch. You're getting to the end of how big a wind turbine really could be or should, or should be. Now, I told you about the efficiency, right? You start out with the wind power, all that power coming into the wind. <clears throat> the rotor probably is only 45% efficient, not 59%. And then you lose things in the bearings, you lose it in the gearbox, in the, gen in the generators. As you go through the conversion of this thing to the grid, you're going to lose some more. So finally, 40% efficiency is probably what you are in wind turbines. You just have to live with that. And that's when you're at the rated wind speed. When you're off the wind rated wind speed, of course, your, your efficiency is, is less. Now, what about construction and maintenance? This is an important part of wind turbines. Um, Here's some pictures of pieces of tower that people have to haul someplace and put and put put them up. It's a huge thing when they were putting up the 1.5 megawatt wind turbine at Tucumcari. The whole town came out. It was like the biggest thing that had ever happened. It's it's a huge it's a huge in industry. Um, here's one of the Vestas offshore uh, platforms with a helicopter actually coming to bring supplies and parts to bring pe people out, and that's that's. Part of the issue with wind turbines, you you just you have to maintain them. And if you go to YouTube, you can find movies of wind turbines that one blade flew off, and then all of a sudden the whole thing crashed. So you you can't afford to have something go wrong. And so you have monitoring systems that measure all the vibrations all the time. And if all of a sudden vibrations start to change and they don't look like they used to look, you shut it down, send a technician up to the top, begin to look at that gearbox, inspect everything, because you just can't afford a catastrophic failure. There's a whole in industry about people who repair wind turbines. There's a wonderful little film, you can get it, it's called Harness to the Wind, about rock climbers who in their off season repair wind turbines, like a bird flies into a wind turbine blade. They repel down, they start up here, they repel down the blades with their little fiberglass patch kits and patch the holes, you know, get them on, then they come up and they said they love it. They, for two or three months, they patch wind turbines and make enough money to rock climb the rest of the year you know, to do that. But there's a whole industry involved uh, just in, in patching those. Here's a smaller turbine. You see one in the background here. 
typical kind of tower. You gotta go inside of here. There's probably a stairs, a spiral stairs that goes up to the top. Some of the bigger ones have an elevator inside where the, the, uh, the technicians have to go in to work to work on it. That's all part of what happens. Now what about air density and altitude and what happens when you begin to go up? Um, here's the plot. This is air density versus temp temperature. Okay, so but basically uh, what happens is you get ha ha hotter and hotter, the air gets less dense, it gets lighter. So light air is good like if Albert Pujols wants to hit a home run, but it's not good for wind turbine. You like, you like a lot of energy in the air, you want heavy air. So you like cold. Cold days are better than hot days. High, when you go high altitude, you get cold, so that's better. But high altitude means low density the other way because you're getting higher. So there's sort of a trade-off you know, where is the best air that I can get? Um, air is very turbulent. If you measure airspeed as a function of time, it's not just a big flat curve. It's going all over the place. And you've got to figure out, you know, you may be designing here, but you've got some spikes up here. You've got some fatigue loads, and all those things have to be worried. And then if you look at the wind speed versus altitude, okay, as you go um, basically... Um, higher and higher in altitude, the wind speed gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So you go up to 20 and 30,000 feet, then you're up to 60 mile an hour, 100 mile an hour wind. Well, wind goes as the cube of the, the power goes as cube of the wind speed. So a 100 mile an hour wind has a thousand times the power of a 10 mile an hour wind. Of course, up at that altitude, the density is only about half of what it is on the ground. But still half of a thousand is 500. So you have a 500 times the energy to density that's up there. Uh, because of this, people have been talking about tethered windmills. Windmills you put up, I'm doing work right now for a company called uh, Baseload Inc. And this is their concept of a, a wind turbine. These are four 70 foot diameter rotors. Imagine it's on this big quad and there's cables and this is flying like a kite uh, at 20 or 30,000 feet. Okay, an idea is up there, you can get a lot of power, the cable also can serve as a power. Now, you think this is really pie in the sky, but they have cleared the land in Oregon, they've built the base, the FAA has cleared their airspace, and they have flown smaller per prototypes. It's like a two, a ma I think about a two megawatt machine here, but they, they built and actually flown some smaller. In fact, it's easy to fly a rotary wing kite like this. The Germans in World War II had these little rotary wing kites on submarines. And when the submarine had surfaced, they'd put a guy in the kite on a cable and fly it up just with the wind turning the rotor makes the lift. And then he'd look for ships if there were any nearby and they'd crank him back in, all right? Um, if a ship was coming up too fast, sometimes they had to just cut the cable and say goodbye to him because they had to go down faster. But so it's, it's you, you, you can, the wind turbines develop their own lift. Okay, so you can do this. Other concepts have wings up here that hold it up, or balloons, different ways to hold, hold, to hold, hold it up. The idea being maybe if we could go to these high altitudes, the wind up there is larger and it's more steady. It's more reliable. You know, day in, day out, you've always got, wherever the jet stream is, you have, you have had that wind. Well, let's do some concluding remarks now about uh, wind energy and its development. Um, the well-known definition of Brundtland, Chairman of the World Commission, says the development uh, the, basically says that um, sustainable energy is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And so this is one of the ideas behind wind energy. It's one of the contributors to energy that's sustainable, right? The wind is going to always be there. We're not slowing down the wind by any stretch of the imagination, even close enough to change the weather patterns or anything like that. The amount of energy that's in the whole atmosphere of the, the Earth is huge. Um, with current and expected tax, uh, tax uh, credits for harnessing the wind, uh, we could reduce greenhouse gas emission, electrical energy generation through wind, and we could get 25% of the U.S. electricity by 2035. And that means large diameter wind, wind turbines that have been successfully developed both onshore and offshore could be used. You don't need more technology than that. You can always work on that. Those kind of things would work. Right now, Denmark generates 20% of its electricity from the wind. I said they, they lead the world in how, 
and how much they actually use. Um, now, wind energy is not completely green. There are still things that happen. We're, uh, we're plotting here, so CO2, and then I'll do these right now. Uh, CO2, SO2, and NOx for different winds, different uh, sources. Of course, you, coal is very large in these areas. You go down to uh, the natural gas, nu nuclear, hydro, biomass, wind. You say, why would wind have any emissions at all? Well, you got to build them. There's materials. You know, you have to do things. So you, this isn't free. So you're, you have emissions that come during the process, the making of fiberglass, the making of aluminum or steel. So it's not, you know, it's not, there are still emissions, but there's so much less than for some of the other sources. And hopefully we can make these go, go down in the future because they have that future. Um, this is that Cape Cod one I was talking about, uh, based, basically trying to build that offshore wind project in Cape Cod. And um, high winds and shallow waters offshore are an attractive re -re resource. Europe does a lot of that. But in the United States, there's not really a lot of places to do that. And the places that do want to do it, they're interested more in tourism and having a nice view, actually, than trying to uh, generate electricity. Um, this is a wind farm off Nynestad in southern De Denmark that provides 166 megawatts of electricity. So you can kind of get a picture. If you look out your window, would you be unhappy seeing that out there? You know, I don't know. Or see, see a bunch of dead birds floating in the water below it. You know, you may not want that. Um, but in, in 2009, it came up again. Just this past month in the news, I heard this thing's back in the news again. They're still trying to do this Cape Cod project. I mentioned the wind energy research that, that we, we did. We finally closed, shut down our wind turbine in 2001 when Kurt Hohenemser passed away at the age of 96. He was still very active up until that time. Um, so in conclusion, 2030 to, oh, not 50-50, sorry, man. I've, so, I've shown this a lot of times. It's the first time I've seen that. Uh, 2030 to 2050, wind energy could supply 20 30, maybe even the third, 35 percent. Um, we could ex exploit offshore sites more, okay, if we could get around this vis visual effect. Wind farms on land, as well as offshore, there you could have these large wind turbines with this huge farm where you have the economy of scale, like they're doing down in uh, to Texas. And for those kind of turbines, our current predictive capabilities, um, really we need more improvement. We don't really know in a wind turbine farm how one turbine affects the one behind it. Okay, we don't have really good data for that, and that's why my friend Andy Swift is doing that. Um, according to 2010 ASME Mechanical Engineering, energy to meet electricity needs is shaping up as a big job with lots of, o lots of openings. Um, the world energy demand is gonna double between now and 2030, that's only 20 years. The amount of clean U.S. energy we'll need by 2050 just to stabilize CO2 is 10 trillion watts. So we're going to need a lot of, a lot of clean energy. Um, uh, Gary Golden, who's a senior project manager at the Electrical Power Research Institute, says the power industry has about 10% of the engineers we need. If you look at the engineers we're putting out compared to China, even per capita, it's just very, very meager. So I'd like to dedicate the lecture to Kurt Hohenemser, um, um, who is my, my mentor at Washington University. That behind him is our 25-foot diameter wind turbine that we ran out at Tice, Tyson. And um, he was the guy who lived what he preached. He, uh, he rode a bicycle to work every day to Washington, even up into his 90s. He had a home that was so well insulated, he hardly ever ran the furnace. And every time he came to my house, he was always readjusting my furnace. Right, to get it to get it to be more efficient. All right, thanks very much, and I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions you might have. Yes. Ten slides back. Yeah. Uh, when you showed the CO, you know, cold and yeah. Right, right. When they're operational, so it just has to do when you install them, you got to make the stuff. You know, they, yeah. Right. 
20 years, probably 20 years, yeah. So um, there's, and of course, this also has to do with how, how you get rid of something when it's done. You know, how do you, like you now we're switching from incandescent light bulbs to these other light bulbs that are all full of mercury, right? What, what are we gonna do when these bulbs are done? What are we gonna do with all that stuff? So, I mean, no one's, somebody asked me that the last time I gave this talk. I've never seen a really good life cycle cost and life cycle emissions over the whole life of a wind turbine or a nu nuclear plant from cradle to grave. You know, what's this gonna take? Do you have salt mines out in Utah? Are you gonna put the nuclear waste there or what it is? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, there's several challenges there. She's talking about getting the wind power onto the grid. There's the voltage issues. Uh, we, well, we did it at our Tyson, we ran what's called a synchronous generator. So we were always running at 60 cycles, but that meant if we weren't generating enough power to overcome the drag, the generator became a, mo a motor. And so we had, a, we had actually an electric meter that we ran backwards when we were generating power, but in some ways it would slow up and it would run the other way, and we were drawing power out of the grid to drive the wind turbine. I wonder about the Alberici one. I don't know about that one, if it's... Uh, how that's how that's done and one of the biggest problems is the utilities don't need power all the time they need power at peak periods right when everybody has your air conditioner on their coal-fired power plants are underutilized so they don't want the power when wind turbine power is mainly during the night is bigger than the day you know so it's not when you need it of course it's clean power so no matter when you generate it you're trading clean power for dirty power, but still, they don't really need our power. It's only because they're being forced to buy it, they buy it. Otherwise, they, they would not. If we had power at peak periods, they would buy that from us, because that, that would mean money. So, um, yes? It may be, yeah, and I, this is really just wind, but yeah, solar thermal it's in terms of creating hot water for your house and heating it. But in terms of generating electricity, you know, heat engines are very inefficient. What my friend Andy Swift actually, at, uh, when he was at the University of Texas El Paso, he had solar ponds, which did generate electricity. They, they would take these ponds and salt them with salt brine. They were already kind of salty. And they'd stratify in terms of the salt. And what happens was, Normally when water heats up, it expands and it comes to the top. But this stuff was backwards. When the water heated, it would sink. <laughs> and so the sun, it was 115 out there all the time. The sun had hit the water, it would sink to the bottom. The bottom was very, very hot. And he'd run heat engines, pipes down to the bottom, run the heat engines through a cycle. And he was actually generating electricity that was used by that Tabasco company. I forgot what it is. He was running that for them. And you can also... Uh, you can use it to do other things like desalinate water. He was doing that. And then use that salt to seed your next pond <laughs> that you're going to grow. And there was some in is Israel that way, and he had some too. Yeah, so there's ways to you know, take solar energy and turn it into electri electricity. But the efficiency goes with the difference in the two temperatures. And they're not that far apart, so it's hard to get very efficient. Here on the, yeah, down here. Yeah, I don't have the num numbers for that, but that's a huge area too. And there's two kinds of ocean power he talked about. One is tidal power. The tides go in and the tides go out. That's a huge. There's also just the wave motion, just the, the random motion of trying to harness that. And there's a lot of work on that. Of course, the ocean's very corrosive. You know, it's difficult to make things that work out in the ocean that don't, that don't corrode. But yeah, or people talk about the Mississippi River, just throwing this thing in the river and you got a little generator to, to run whatever you're, you're, you're doing. But for big things, you know, you're talking about tidal power, especially places where there's big tides where you could really generate. But I don't have the numbers for how much is available. You had a question down here? Yeah, about 20 years is usually the design life. And, um, and the fatigue loads are a big issue, especially how much turbulence, you know, each place is different. But in our, in our wind cores, we talk about fatigue life, you know, just, just how, and, the, and the, the turbulence itself, 
you know, you all know when you're out in the wind, you have this turbulence, the wind's going up and down. But it turns out when you're in a, on the blade, if you're sitting on a blade going around, because you're going around, you sort of pull out of the turbulence these big spikes of the frequency content of all the, the integer multiples. And Kurt Hohenemser and his students were the first to, to see that. And so the fatigue loads are much bigger than you thought they were going to be if you were just thought about you stuck a pole up and how much loads were on it. Going around in, in circle, you tend to mag, mag, magnify those. So that's, that's a big thing. Yes? No. So these are not, he's talking about laminar flow airfoils. And you, you're, years ago, people discovered they could invent these airfoils with very, very low drag. And they were going to put these in airplanes. Then a mosquito would fly out and impale itself on the airfoil. And it had tripped the boundary layer. And there was no good. No, these are mainly the airfoils are n normal airfoils. You, a lot of them are very thick. Because if you go near the root, you need to be pretty thick. But they're lower Reynolds number airfoils which is an, it's a, a, a number of how viscous the air is. So helicopter blades are like th six million, you know, Reynolds numbers. These are much lower, maybe down to, to 100,000. Hundred but they work pretty well up to high angles of attack. You don't want them to stall. And so the airfoils are pretty good. There's, you could generate a little more efficiency by better airfoils, but it turns out that's not where you, most of the loss is. Most of the losses are you could get the most energy if you can slow down all the wind that's coming into you uniformly. Slow every bit, one mile, every place, the same amount. If you can slow it all down the same, that is the most power you can get for any force. And it's hard to do that. It's hard to, near the center of the wind turbine, you just can't put as much force on. And that's where uh, most of the losses are as compared to drag. Yes? Yeah, there are things. I'm not expert on those things, but I know people are working on that, you know, using the river, you know, to generate small amounts of electricity. Somebody in the back. I, I've been, haven't been looking back there. Yeah, somebody back there? Yeah, this was just the United States interest. Now, for, for, in, for in individual homes, that's another story. And Missouri's a place you, you know, you, if you wanted at your farm, put a little wind turbine out there, you could generate electricity. You probably couldn't make it as cheap <coughs> as you can buy it. But as a matter of print principle, you'd like to do it, or if you're in a place where there's no, no electricity. There's a wonderful book. If you all are uh, looking for a book for a high school or college kid to read or you want to read it, it's called um, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's a true story about this kid in Africa who was too poor to go to school. He couldn't even afford the books. And it was during time of famine. And he went to the library, though, and taught himself basic physics and engineering. And he built a wind turbine in his little village in Africa. He went to, the, everything was from the junkyard. He got the, 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 the uh, generator from a tractor. He actually used a fan blade from a truck for the hub. He took PVC pipe. He didn't have any tools, but he could heat things. He would cut the pipe with hot metal, bent it out to make blades, and he generated electricity. And even as a little village, they have cell phones and radios. They were going to the next village and paying exorbitant prices to get their batteries charged. He would charge him. He started lighting his house and other houses. <coughs> he almost burned down his house till he discovered the uh, circuit breaker. And then he, and he invented his own circuit breakers that he built. He ended up going to college and getting a scholarship. But yeah, it's just a wonderful, yeah, these small wind turbines in third world countries to pump water to make electricity are here in Missouri. That's a, that's a great thing. But it's not going to make a dent in terms of doing 20 or 30, because there's just not enough wind here in Missouri to do that. Yes? Yeah, it turns out one skinny, if he had, if I have 150 pounds to make a blade out of, one long, thin blade is more efficient. It's like airplanes, the thinner and longer the wings are, the more efficient they are. So they, these sailplanes have very thin, long wings. So the thinner you can make the wing, the smaller the aspect ratio, that's the most efficient. So if I had a certain amount of material, that, that's what I'd do. But in practice, you can't do that. 
And so in practice, you got to come in and so still a few is better. Now, it's, if you just had a certain area and said, I'm only allowed this, this area and I have to stop the wind, I'm not allowed to go bigger or smaller, then you want a lot, a lot of blades, right? There's, some, there's a maximum then, an optimum, uh, what you call, uh, it's a percentage of the total area covered by blades, the, the, the uh, solidity. But even then, the optimum solidity is about 15% or something. You, know, you, you don't want to, you think you want to fill the whole thing up with blades, but you don't, because it's going really fast. And so it's sweeping. It's, it's covering the area in, in time. Yes? Yeah, you, um, if you're sitting on this blade, you have some pitch angle, you have wind coming in like this, that's from your rotational speed. So the faster you go, the bigger this wind has. Then you have the wind that you're pumping, right? And it's coming in down like that. So you basically have this, this angle. You want to cut into the wind at the optimum speed. If you start spinning faster and faster, you start, low, you start to lower that angle that you're going to cut into the wind. And every airfoil has its maximum lift to drag place. Because the, the, the lift goes up with angle of attack, but so, so, so does the drag. So your lift to drag ratio has an optimum. So that's where you want it to be. If you go and you've, you've got, what happens is you've got to have that tilt because that's what drives your wind turbine. If the air is coming in, you know, to certain, here's your omega R going sideways and here's this wind coming down, the wind's cutting in, the lift is perpendicular to that wind. And that's what's pulling you through the air. So you got to tilt the lift. And if, you, if you're going too fast, that angle's just too small. And you're not, you're not. So most wind turbines around the world are running right around in that range, about maybe five to seven times the wind speed at the tip. Then as you go inboard, you start to twist, right? And you sort of to do, to do, do that up. Yes. Right. Yeah, you, so you don't want to do that. What happens is if you get to the point where it's going to take power to turn your wind turbine, then you, that's the cut in speed. You want to shut it off. Yeah, and if you, at ours at Tyson, we didn't have the computer power. We just had old Apple computers to turn it off. But these computer, once you get to the point where you'd have to draw, you don't do that. You cut it off and you stop. Okay. Yeah, if you, well, you have a generator, which basically is a synchronous generator. So it's always running at the same speed. But as the wind power changes, your torque gets bigger or less. So you're working harder. It's like if you were turning your ice cream, you're making a home, homemade ice cream. If you just kept turning at the same speed all the time, as the ice cream got thicker, you'd have to push harder and harder, but you're still keeping the same speed. And that's what happens with these uh, generators. The wind speed gets higher and higher, and there's more power. They just push back harder so you can make more, more electricity. But finally, you reach the point where you're going to break the handle, right? You reach the point where the transmission can't do it, and that's the cutout speed. You just got to stop then and not, not, do, not do, do any more. Yes? Yeah, a lot of the manufacturers in Texas and also on the East Coast, and you'll see, maybe you've seen it already, I've seen it before, a big long truck with a wind turbine blade on it heading through Tennessee. Yeah, our train, that's right, heading through. So, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, and that's part of the issue. That's all, of course, figured into the installation cost to get it to where it is and then, and then, and then to assemble it. Oh, when they were making the one at Tucumcari, New Mexico, they got it about halfway up, and, and GE said, "Oh, whoops! You know, we made we made we made a mistake. We're gonna <laughs> okay. We got to take this thing apart and put something else on." And then GE said, "But you know, you didn't buy a maintenance contract. 
So you're gonna have to pay for this. And they said, what do you mean we don't, you have, you have to build it first. I said, no, no we don't. So the lawyers got involved, of course. And they said that the key day was when the lawyer for Tucumcari Mesa Lands Community College said, okay, we'll just go before a jury here in Tucumcari, New Mexico and see whether they vote for General Electric multi-billion dollar corporation or they vote for Little Mesa Lands Community College in Tucumcari, New Mexico, and that was then they, they agreed to do it. <laughs> but yeah there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of issues in getting anything built in construction and that's, that's part of it. Yes? Yeah. That's a very good question. He's asking about storage, because since the wind energy isn't when you need it, can you store it? People are working on this night and day, and there's not any storage, you lose energy, of course. It's not very efficient. So people have thought about all kinds of things, storing, pumping water, so you can then use a water generator, or charging batteries, or you know what to do, or running flywheels or something. How do you store the energy? But there's not been a really good solution to that. Um, about the only thing I mean you can really say is that we're never we're talking about never more than 20 to 30 percent of the whole power of the United States. So you can always use that power, right? Shut down the coal plants. Don't shut us down, you know. But um, but in terms of economics, that's not an answer. That's just a clean environment answer. So yeah, that's a very important question because other kind of form like geothermal or nuclear or coal, and maybe they'll be able to clean up coal, you know. But um, to do that there, you can make it when you want it, and that's very, that's another reason wind will never be 100% of our power. That's just not going to happen. It's going to be something that's going to augment the power um, in so, some way or in a, a, another, but it's not going to be the final answer. Yes, and then back there next. All right. How are they? Oh, man, that's a really good question. For our wind turbine at Tyson, let me say this, the first week it was up, it was hit by lightning. And it, it melted all the bearings. They just like melted and fused together. So after that, we put up a uh, light lightning rod. In the next 20 years, it never got hit by lightning once. You know, but <laughs> to do that, and tornadoes, same way. Yeah, you, you've got to design them to be able to, a real tornado, I mean. But, you know, you have to design them maybe a 100 mile an hour wind, you know, or something like that. And they have to be able to shut down, break, and then somehow be stowed in a secure position. And that's a very important thing. But a tornado, you know, we saw what happened in Jop Joplin. There's nothing going to be tornado proof. Okay, back there was a question. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was up there. Um, I don't know if I. No, I just had the installed. You're right. No, I've never seen a good computation of that the actual cradle to grave, you know total life cycle costs of what it's costing you for kilowatt hour. It may be out there so some, somewhere. I've only seen for installed kilowatt hour. Um, so yeah, that's a very good calculation. So I'm sure somebody must have done it, but it's not, it's not, e not easily ava available. And that's probably the most important number. Yes? Yeah. And that, that's because what we have now. Now, yeah, I think there's going to be more solar, especially as photovoltaics get cheaper. And the cheaper they get, the more solar is going to be important. And like I say, in Texas, they're putting up these solar panels between the wind, the wind turbines. Um, you know, it'd be great to put solar panels up in space if you could figure out a way to get the power down here. Because I always said you could kind of microwave it down or lay, laser it down, and then that would also be a weapon. Maybe you could talk to the Department of Defense into, fu into fu funding this whole thing for us, you know, or something. But, but yeah, that's the, po that's the question, how to get it down. Because, yeah, solar is so huge in terms of the amount. In the way, corn is solar energy. You know, the, you know all these biofuels, you're absorbing all that uh, solar energy to turn it into eth ethanol. So, yeah, I think that's going to get better and better, more and more. But, again, it will never be the total power, at least in my, my lifetime, what the United States is. All right.
Yeah, I don't know of that reach. I know, you know, people have been looking at a way to do superconductors that don't have to be at absolute z z zero or something and trying to lo lower that. But I'm not, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I don't know about that. But that is an issue. Because like, you know, Missouri, we have to buy now a certain amount, we have to use a certain amount of uh, uh, alternative energy. We can't make it here in Missouri, so we gotta buy it. We gotta buy it from Kansas or whatever. You know, if there is a way to really transmit the power more cheaply, that would really help. Yes? Yeah, I do not know what the subsidies are at this time. They're less than they used to be, and they're going down. Somebody was telling me today that I think at the, at the end of December, some of them may run out, too. So I'm not, but I, I don't know what, what, what the subsidies are now. All right, I think we may be about done. Oh, one more. Sorry, where are you? All right. You mean in terms of the 20 year lifespan? I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure I'm, I'm going to get that, I'm going to get in the question you're, you're asking, you know. Oh, no, they, 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 no, they, somebody knows. I just don't have the numbers. I've not seen it. No, there, there, somebody has done that cal calculation, I'm sure. But I, I've, I've just not seen a cradle to grave, including disposal of the wind turbine at the end uh, to do that. Right. But it's not just eight miles a gallon. It's how much will it cost to dispose of my car when I'm done with it? How much will it cost to maintain the car? You know, so it's how much the amortize the money it takes from the loan I'm getting on the car. So, I mean, all, all of that has, has to go into the life cycle cost of that. All right. I, mean, I think in Missouri they probably are. I mean, there may be parts of the country where they're not, where you have really good wind, and you might be able to, to, to make it. I know, you know, Washington, we have this nice building on the corner of Skinker and um, Forest Park that has these white, and we, we light them up at night. Some of my students did the calculation that we don't, they don't generate enough electricity to light themselves up, right? So it's probably, they're probably, but, but it's, it's, it's a statement. Of course, you're trying to make a statement. We're interested in energy, but yeah. So um, yeah, for economically in this part of the country, that's just, that's just not a good thing. But there's parts of the country it might, it might make sense where you could build a wind turbine, put one up, and you'd actually make, and GE's selling a lot of these 1.5 megawatt machines for industries and universities and, and colleges that are, that, are, that are making it. Yeah. All right, over there. Yeah, well, we're, we're doing both. And of course, the Clean Coal and Initiative is a lot of research that's going on. I think uh, Ameren just pulled out of Clean Coal, I think, uh, last week. But it's a possibility, if you could clean coal, if you could get, you know, we're trying, you could sequester the carbon dioxide, then they wouldn't be shutting down coal-fired power plants. They'd be building them. And we've got 300 years of coal sitting in the ground here. So if you could figure out a way to burn the coal but keep the carbon dioxide from going out the stack, they've already figured out how to stop the sulfur dioxide and the NOx from going out. If you, if you could stop the carbon dioxide from going out, you would really have some. So I think the, 
uh, there's a benefit. But there's other research like my own at Wash University. People are doing, we have a lot of solar energy research in the engineering department in terms of improving uh, for photovoltaics, wind energy research that's, that's going on there. But clean coal is a huge poss possibility just because of all the coal we have. You know, we only have uh, 50 years of oil maybe, but we got 300 years of coal if we could figure out a way to use it with, without hurting the environment. Yes? Uh, I, I'm not, not, we're, we're, mm -hmm. well, no, we're talking, we there's nay now. We're talking about getting clean coal in the future. We're talking about could we burn the coal and then catch the stuff before it goes out, okay? To, ca to catch this stuff, it's already was in the coal anyway. We would just be moving it to somewhere else, but it wouldn't go into the ap ap atmosphere. So we don't have clean coal now, but someday we could. That's it. Yeah, well, even back, I mean, going in the 1930s when Raymond R. Tucker was here in St. Louis, we had clean coal. He went from high sulfur coal, so it's cleaner coal, right? So that's what they mean by that, it's cleaner. But to actually really pure clean coal, that's still something down in the future. All right. I, I used to, I think a 1.5 megawatt wind turbine is a couple of million dollars. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. All right, thanks.